I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18 is our text. And if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. I think you'll see them underneath the, the, some of the chairs. And turn to page 1042, page 1042. You'll be able to find Luke 18. You'll be able to follow along with this. And, uh, and if you're here and you don't own a Bible, you don't have a Bible, and you want one, take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. Uh, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please message us, email us at the church office, calvaryaz.com. We'd be glad to get you a Bible one way or the other. Uh, because we want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, hey, uh, I just wanted to uh, invite you to pray for uh, myself and the group that is leaving Calvary on Tuesday morning to head to Israel. We're going on a Holy Land trip. There's 36 of us that are going. And, uh, and I know some of you are like, rats, I wanted to go and uh, missed it. So we'll do it again in a couple of years. So keep that in mind. But, uh, but on, on top of that, not only do we want you to pray for the, the trip and uh, we make all the connections and the flights don't get canceled and all that fun stuff, but uh, we're, we're going to miss the Main Street Halloween thing. In fact, the reason that Robert was inviting you to volunteer, we need about 30 more volunteers, it's all my fault. So I just want you to know that uh, I'm, not only is, am I going, but a lot of people who normally uh, volunteer and bring others with them to volunteer are going to Israel, and so I screwed up. And I'm just confessing that. So uh, if uh, you would like to help me out and volunteer, it's a, it's a sweet gig, literally, because you're there in charge of candy, and I have witnessed for years that there's a number of people who believe in quality control checks throughout the evening. So if you're thinking, hey, you know what? I want to dress up for Halloween. I want to eat candy, and I want to consider, uh, you know, get blessed doing it, then this is the way to do it. So just volunteer and help out on Main Street, and, and just know you're filling in for me because uh, I'm going to be uh, suffering in the Holy Land. Uh, so, hey, not nearly as much candy, though. Uh, just, just saying. Hey, have you ever been, uh, have you ever experienced injustice? You know, you've gotten the raw end of the deal. You've been cheated by someone. You've been falsely accused of something. Or maybe you lost in court when you were in the right. Anyone ever experienced injustice? Anyone? Okay, lots of hands go up. Uh, it's frustrating. In fact, really, when you're in the midst of it, it's infuriating. And it doesn't matter if it's the legal system or at our job or dealing with a government agency or when you're in school, that, that feeling of helplessness and powerlessness is awful. And, and when that happens, how do we respond to it? Now, Jesus understands injustice, okay, because he suffered it. You know, if you, if you don't understand how he understands it, he was railroaded and crucified and he was completely innocent. But he used injustice to teach on prayer. Uh, and so I want uh, us to look at this passage in Luke 18 tonight. And, and I want us to understand uh, this parable because it's interesting, it's confusing. Uh, but if we understand it, it can alter our mindset. It can change our frustration level and really it can change our prayer life if we'll apply it to our lives. So Luke 18, beginning in verse 1. And it says, And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, Jesus frames the entire parable with a simple admonition for all of us. And if you don't get anything else, get this one statement. Always pray, don't lose heart. 
Always pray, don't lose heart. I mean, that's what he said. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Always pray, don't lose heart. This, this is key to understanding Jesus' teaching in the passage, and it's a reminder that we are to always pray, don't lose heart. So to illustrate, Jesus tells the parable, and then he provides a picture of human justice, or really injustice. So it's, it's this picture of the unjust judge. Uh, so Jesus is talking to common poor people. Uh, what, what uh, a lot of scholars call the people of the land. In other words, they were subsistence farmers. Uh, they, they, uh, they had no rights to speak of. They weren't rich. They weren't powerful. So they lived with constant injustice. They were defrauded and abused on a regular basis. In, in fact, if you want to know how often it happened, then read the prophets in the Old Testament because they are always talking about how you treat the poor people. How you treat the people, how you treat the widows, how you treat the orphans, how you treat the people of the land. Don't, don't steal from them, don't abuse them. And, and in fact, a lot of the judgment that falls on Israel is because of the way they treat the poor. So they understood authorities like the judge in the story. They were used to people, you know, mistreating them. Uh, you know, they, what Jesus calls him corrupt, unrighteous, this unrighteous judge. Uh, he didn't fear God, didn't fear man, no compulsion to do what is right. And they understood the plight of the widow. Okay, they, they, they got it. I mean, she is captive to a corrupt system, helpless to get justice. So she does the only thing she can do. She shows up every single day begging for justice. She's like, well, he won't give me justice. I can't buy justice. She can't bribe him. She doesn't have anything. So she'll just harass him into maybe giving him justice. And she is so persistent, the unrighteous judge gives her justice. Now, th this is a weird story. Let's just go ahead and call it that. And, and there's often a misconception in this passage. And the misconception, the misunderstanding is this, that God is, is like the unrighteous judge, and we have to pester him until he gives in. That is not what Jesus is trying to tell us. That is not what the parable means. So if that's what you're reading it thinking, okay, I just got to bother God more. That's not the message. This is not, th this parable does not represent what God is like to us. Okay, so maybe you're here. And, well, you are here, but maybe you're here today. <laughs> All right. And you're, maybe you're upset about injustice in your life. Maybe you think God is unfair. Maybe you think God is uncaring or inactive because he hasn't answered prayer for you. Uh, maybe you're hopeless because you feel like the system is rigged. And if that's you, then Jesus is telling you, always pray, don't give up, don't lose heart. Uh, you see, and, and, and Jesus wants us to see God the correct way. He wants us to see God accurately, the way that Jesus is portraying him, portraying him. So see an example of God's justice. Okay, an example of God's justice. Look down at verse 7 again, and, and Jesus says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? He's saying, look, God's going to give you justice. He is. In fact, Jesus uses the unrighteous judge in contrast with God, not as a symbol for God, but in contrast with God. So he's saying, hey, look, even this unrighteous judge eventually gave justice to his widow. God's not like that at all. He is going to respond to your needs. See, God is the opposite of the unjust judge. Jesus says God is for you, and he's going to fight to provide justice for you. And, and I got to remind you, this is not the only time Jesus talked about prayer, even in the Gospel of Luke. If you look back a few pages, to uh, Luke 11. Jesus does an extensive teaching on prayer. We preached on this in July. Uh, verse 9 says, And Jesus said, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You see, if we want to always pray and not lose heart, 
we need to understand this prayer dynamic between us and God. Okay? And I want you to always pray, not lose heart. Jesus wants you to pray and, and not lose heart. So we must understand this. When we come to God with a request, when you come to God with a request, whether that is a request for justice or provision, a request for healing or just wisdom, we begin with relationship. Okay, this, this whole thing begins with relationship. God is our Father, and God loves us. God loves you. So do you have a relationship with Jesus? So do you have a relationship with Jesus? Okay, well, I just want to make sure you were still awake. You're with me. So you have a relationship with Jesus. God loves you, and I want you to, I want you to try to grasp this. Uh, how many of you are parents in this room? Okay. Do you love your kids? God loves you more than you love your children. Okay, stop and think about that right now. God loves you infinitely more than you love your, chi your kids. Wait, here, let me shock you. God loves you more than you love your grandkids. <laughs> See, some of you are like, I don't know about that. Yeah, he does. <laughs> See, when you come to God in prayer, it is a, it's the act of approaching your father who loves you to make a request. No fear, no doubt that he cares for you. Uh, see, I, I don't know how your grandkids treat you, but my grandkids are not afraid to ask me for anything. Okay, and if it's in my power, I will give it to them, right? That, I mean, that's, that's kind of, they know that Papa wants to give them what they, what they want, and they know I'm a soft touch too. So they're not afraid to ask, and it's because of our relationship. Now, because of this relationship, we know that, that we have with God, we know that God also wants to provide us with blessing. Okay, when you come to God in prayer, no matter what situation, know that God wants to bless you. We already know this. Jesus just told this, uh, this in chapter 11 when he said, hey, I I any of you who are evil, if your son asks you for a fish, do you give him a snake? Uh, if he asks you for an egg, do you give him a scorpion? And they're all like, No. Right, so if you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father wants to give good gifts to you. Now, every parent I know wants to bless their children. We already established that. You love them, you want to bless them. Uh, and if you have grandkids, you really want to bless them. And we are imperfect. We're selfish. Uh, I, honestly, we're evil. And we still want to bless. So God loves us perfectly, and his desire is to bless us. His desire is to be generous towards us and show kindness to us. In other words, God wants you to be successful. Now, when I say that, there's people who go, yes, I knew it. Well, here's the thing. God wants you to be successful according to his definition, not yours. See, our definition of success usually involves money and power. God's definition of success involves love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It involves understanding that, that you make an impact in this world for the kingdom of God. That's success. So God wants to bless you. Do you believe that God wants to bless you? Okay. If you believe that God wants to bless you, it really helps because a lot of people still see God as judge not as a loving father. And sometimes you've been handicapped because you didn't have a loving father and that whole concept of God as father is tough for you to stomach. But God loves you and he wants to bless you. And this is one where we struggle. God is responsive to his children. He's responsive to his children. He tells us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And he says when you ask, you're gonna get answered. You seek and you're gonna find. You knock, the door's gonna be opened. He's not like the unjust judge. And in other words, Jesus is saying that God is a default yes parent. He wants to, he wants to bless us. His, his answer is yes, which begs the question, why don't we get what we ask for? Am I the only one who asked that question? Anybody else join with me? Why don't we get what we ask for? I mean, because, you know, here we are, and Jesus says, you ask and it'll be given to you. And we're like, okay, I'm asking and I'm not getting it. Why am I not getting it? Am I the only person who ever says, God, what are you doing? Because I asked that. I mean, that's how I start about half my prayers. He doesn't tell me what he's doing, but I still ask the question. By the way, there are reasons we don't get what we ask for. 
Biblical reasons, let me, let me just share with you three biblical reasons we don't get what we ask for. You may want to take notes. They're not in your, in your notes. But you can come back to this and think about them and see where you're guilty. Uh, the first reason is because we ask for something that will not bless us. I mean, we ask for stuff that will actually hurt us, and God's not going to give us that. All right? I'm not going to ask you to show your hands because I already know the answer that most of you have prayed at some point in your life to win the lottery. And... Uh, or the publisher's clearing house if you don't gamble, right? Or something like that. But, but you, you've, you've prayed for some kind of financial windfall and God didn't give it to you probably because he didn't want you to wreck your life. Okay? I, I mean, that's just reality. I mean, the majority of people who win the lottery end up, you know, wasting the money, getting hurt, losing stuff. Uh, they end up worse off than they were. So God wants to protect us. And sometimes we're asking for things and God wants to give us better things. And so he doesn't give us what we ask for because he has something better for us. So we ask for something that will not bless us. God says no. And then the second reason is because we ask selfishly. Selfishly. I mean, James chapter 4, uh, the apostle James says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, I already mentioned that we're selfish and evil and a lot of times we ask for stuff and, and it might sound good but we really just want to spend it on our motives and guess what? You can't lie to God. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what your motives are so there's no point in pretending that your motives are pure all the time because they're not. And so sometimes we're, we're praying and we just might as well go, God, I know this is selfish but I'm asking and he can say no and we're okay with that because uh, we don't get what we ask for because we're selfish. And then the third reason we don't get what we ask for is honestly because God hears and he responds in his time, not ours. In God's time, not ours. Uh, I like to put it this way. God is our father, right? And most of us are, well, I say most of us. A lot of us are stuck at the preschool age in our development. And so we ask God for something and God says, wait. And we throw a temper tantrum because we don't get what we want now. Like right now. Like a three-year-old now kind of thing. And, and if you have three-year-old children or grandchildren, ha, ha, have you had them? And, and, and you said no, or you said in a little bit, and they didn't accept in a little bit as an answer, and they melted down? Had it happened uh, yesterday. So, <laughs> you know, you are coming to my house, but later. No, I want to go now, and it didn't work really well. So we're, we're just impatient preschoolers in the kingdom of God. And, and here's the thing. We cry out, when will you answer us, God? And especially because Jesus, you know, promises in Luke 18. Uh, li listen to this, because this was hard for us to stomach. Verse 8, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Really? Because it doesn't seem that way, does it? We're like, God, we need this now, and we're not getting it now. So why doesn't God answer, heal, or provide, or redeem like we ask when we ask? God does. In his time. Not my time. Definitely not my time. Not your time either. In his time. Uh, not quickly according to his impatient, immature children. But in his time. I mean... When we pray, I, I just, I just got to say this. We're like a bunch of toddlers wanting ice cream right now. And what we really need is a nap. <laughs> if you think about it, we're just like, God, I need right now. And, and we panic and we freak out when God doesn't answer right now. But we got to remember, God is the righteous judge. Everyone's going to give an account to God. Justice will be served. And God gives justice speedily in the context of eternity. In fact, in the context of eternity, justice is just a moment away. It just seems like a long time for us. So I did a, th I, I, I don't know if you guys realize this, but the Apostle Peter in his second letter tells us that to God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. You ever heard that? Now, it's symbolic. It's just trying to tell us that God doesn't see time the way that you and I see time. Which is why in God's time, we, we get impatient and we lose it. and We melt down like a bunch of toddlers uh, because we want it now. And God's like, it's happening. You just don't see it. You just need to wait for it. But I decided, even though it's not literal, I decided to like, what if it was literal? 
What if a day actually equaled a thousand years in eternity? Then an hour would be 42 years. Wait an hour. Can you wait an hour? No, that's a lifetime. God, we don't want to wait an hour. Okay, uh, half a life. A minute. God says just a minute. It's eight months. Eight months. Think about that. So if you're, do you remember asking your dad when you were in the car, how long, how much longer? You know what my answer always was? Five minutes. Because in five minutes, hopefully they'll forget that they asked the question. Five minutes. That was my answer always. Five minutes. I don't know how long it is. It's five minutes. Um, but if God just tells you you have to wait five minutes, that's three and a half years. And, and see, we see the world from our perspective. We need to open up our minds and go, okay, God, you see the world differently than us. And, and, and we can trust you because of our relationship with God and because we know that God wants to bless us, we can trust God to do what's best for us in his time. In his time. So God answers our prayers in his time, in his way to bless us and help us to become more like Jesus. Our part, your part, my part is, have you guys got this yet? To always pray and not lose heart. Always pray, don't lose heart. That, that's what our job is. Now, this passage again doesn't end with Jesus telling us speedily, what is, how does it end? It ends with this question, and, and the question is for all of us. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, the question is for Jesus' followers. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus is asking you a question about when he comes, as one of God's children, will Jesus find you faithful? Will he find us praying and trusting? And, and in other words, will God find you believing the Bible? Well, God finds you believing the Bible. See, here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. What to believe and how to live. Uh, so do you base your beliefs and values on God's word or on your opinions? Are you living according to God's wisdom or conventional wisdom? See, as our culture continues to walk away from our heritage of faith, this will be a point where we are forced to choose. Every single one of us and every single church that preaches the gospel are going to have to choose. Are we going to identify as biblical people or are we going to reject biblical authority to fit in with the culture? Let me say that again. Every one of us is going to have to decide, are we going to be biblical people who hold on to biblical authority or are we going to let go of biblical authority to fit in with the culture? because you're not going to be able to do both. And if you're watching the world and, and the way it's developing, you can see the tensions that are already there, and, and we've already moved way past the tipping point, and so it's a matter of where you're going to stand. And when Jesus comes again, is he going to find you believing his word? And is he going to find you acting on God's promises? See, acting on God's promises means you're applying the word to your life. You don't just say that you believe it. I grew up with all kinds of people who said they believed the Bible as the absolute word of God. They just didn't know any of it to do it. I grew up around people who said they believed the Bible and studied the Bible. They just didn't apply it to their lives. So when Jesus comes back, is he going to find you actually taking the word of God and applying it to your life? That's why we talk about if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. You see, trust and faith is action based on belief. You believe the word is, uh, of God is real and it's true and it's authoritative. You apply it to your life. That's acting on God's promises. See, if you speak words of faith, but you don't actually apply them to your life, it leads to hypocrisy, not faith. And people see that and they discredit Jesus because of it. 
But if you allow God's wisdom to influence your decisions and change your values and guard your life, the Son of Man will call you faithful. So when Jesus comes, will he find you believing the Bible? Will he find you acting on his promises? And will he find you persevering for God's purpose? Persevering for God's purpose. The widow never quit, did she? <laughs> In the story, she never gave up. She endured. She just said, I'm going to keep showing up until I get justice. I'm going to keep showing up, showing up, showing up. I'm not going to give up. Jesus said, always pray, don't lose heart. You know, if you don't give up, it's amazing what you see. If you don't give up, it's amazing what you see. In fact, the Apostle Paul uh, said, and do not lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. So not giving up is a big part of following Jesus. It's just saying, I'm going to endure. I'm going to persevere. And, and, and I'm just telling you, God does miracles when we don't give up. So let me tell you the story of uh, Dorothy and Leo. I met them in the mid-90s when they moved to Havasu, and they were both old, and I mean old. And uh, Dorothy was a, a sweet, saintly woman, always in church, always faithful to Christ. Her husband was mean and, and didn't believe and never had and didn't, didn't like her going to church. But when they moved to Havasu and he was older, he got kind of uh, a little bit... Uh, needy and paranoid and so he didn't want her to go any place without him and she went to church so guess what Leo for the first time in his life started going to church at, at Calvary so that means that this uh, old uh, mean reprobate started hearing the gospel every week and he heard it a hundred times or more and, uh, and, and Leah was the kind of guy that didn't, you know, I couldn't even go visit his house because if I went and visited, he'd be, you know, abusive towards Dorothy after we left. Nobody could go visit. And one day, I got a call. It was 1997, and Leo wanted to see me now. Leo wanted to see me? From a man who had re refused pastoral visits? So I dropped what I was doing, and I went to see Leo, and Leo was adamant that he confessed Jesus as Lord. He's just like, I, I, gotta, I gotta do this. And so we prayed and, and Leo accepted Christ. Uh, he was 89 years old. Uh, Dorothy had been praying for him for over 60 years of marriage. He got baptized about two weeks later and then two weeks after that, he met Jesus face to face. Dorothy was always praying and she didn't give up. She didn't lose heart. Uh, she just kept trusting that God was going to do something and God did something miraculous. So today, will you trust God and keep praying? Will you not lose heart? Because God is at work redeeming people and changing lives. And he will redeem your life. He will answer your prayers if you do not give up. Um, now, I know that uh, we're not about to close the service yet, but at the end of the service, our prayer team is going to be here at the front. They're here at the front uh, uh, at the stage uh, after every single service that we have here at Calvary. We have an amazing prayer team. And if you're sitting here thinking, yeah, but I don't know about this because I got all these needs and, and I don't feel like God's answering my prayers and stuff like that. Can I just encourage you at the end of the service uh, just to come up and let them pray with you, pray for you, even if it's just that you would continue to pray and not give up, not lose heart, because God wants to work in your life today. Will you pray with me now? Father, we love you. Your love is incredible, and while we don't always understand how you're working in our lives, we know that you are working, and you're working to bless us. You're working to heal us. You're working to fill us with faith and hope, and God, we trust you with that. Even when it's hard, and, and God, even when we're tempted to give up because we don't see or understand, give us that faith and that courage to continue enduring so that we can see you work in amazing ways. Uh, and Lord, we ask that you would increase our faith so that when Jesus comes again, we would be found faithful in that moment. 
This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.